want to welcome you to this, the fourth in a series of 10 lectures by the instructors from the Department of Military History at uh, Fort Leavenworth's Command and General Staff College. My name is Jim Wilbanks. I'm the head of the department. And today I have the pleasure of introducing John, Dr. John Caratola, who will be your speaker. John is a retired Marine officer currently serving in the Department of Military History. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of Nebraska, which we'll try not to hold against him and uh, has his PhD from KU, which has sort of a balancing effect there, I suppose. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn the podium over to John. Thank you, boss. Good afternoon. Uh, as uh, my boss, Jim Wilbank said, I'm John Curatola. I'm a retired Marine officer who teaches at an Army school who studies air power. So I've got the entire gamut of everything covered uh, regarding military applications. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about NSC 162, a National Security Council Memo 162-2, which frames the idea of massive retaliation, the idea that the, uh, <clears throat> we're going to respond back during the 50s to communist aggression with this threat of our atomic air arsenal. Okay? And one of the ways this uh, particular application has been looked at is bigger bombs for a brighter tomorrow. Okay? One of the things we've looked at here is this idea of sending mass forward. The picture that I, I put up there for you is the Castle Bravo explosion that goes <clears throat> on the 1st of March of 1954. This is the first deliverable thermonuclear device explosion. Okay? What's interesting about this thermonuclear explosion is the test was originally scheduled to be about 4 megatons, I mean 4 million tons of TNT equivalent. And when the device goes off, it goes up to 15 megatons. Oops. Even the safety director of the experiment quips as the cloud is gaining in altitude. He says, is it ever going to stop? Okay. A few weeks later, they launched another explosion uh, with the same design. It's supposed to be a 4 megaton yield. It ends up going to 13 megatons. Again, oops. Slag rule calculations were all wrong. But the US now has at least a deliverable thermonuclear application available to it. This will be starting to become a, a center stone or centerpiece of American policy with regard to military applications. Okay? Just to, for a histor historical reference, the first thermonuclear explosion actually happens in 1952. It's a 60-ton experimental device that goes off. Okay? What you're seeing here with Castle Bravo is this idea of a deliverable thermonuclear weapon. Okay. Now, at the end of all this new look and massive retaliation piece, the US puts together the first single integrated operation plan. And it gets framed in 1960, just as Eisenhower's leaving office. Okay. And this single integrated operation plan, as you can see up here, is pretty draconian. We're going to destroy 97% of the first designated ground zeros with a 97% uh, assurance delivery piece on this. We're going to keep throwing waves and waves of nuclear weapons at these designated ground zeros to ensure they are destroyed. Okay. <clears throat> we are looking for maximum destru destruction with regard to this particular application. And later on in the 1950s, one of the early thermonuclear designers, a guy by the name of George Kistikowski, goes out there for Ike to look at the single integrated operation plan. He comes back and he goes, I think the first wave is good. You got that right. But these subsequent waves, you're going to kill people four or five times over and over again. There's no appreciation for what damage is going to be occur with this first wave. But you're starting to see here this idea of overkill coming into vogue because they want to make sure that they destroy these Russian and Chinese targets on the first wave. But that, if we don't do that, we're going to hit them again with another wave and another wave and a subsequent wave. And again, this becomes the centerpiece for how we're going to operate. But before we get into NSC 162, we have to look at where we're starting from here in the 1950s as we, as we launch into it. If you attack, uh, attended the very first lecture in this 
particular series, we talked about the origins of the Cold War. And a lot of people frame the origin of the Cold War with the National Security Council uh, document N68. Okay? This is a document that, get, that frames the Cold War as we know it. Okay? What happens is after the Second World War, Harry Truman is very concerned about the national economy. He doesn't want to put a lot of money in defense. He wants to push money into building houses and jobs and prosperity at home. That's where his focus is. Okay? However, September 1949, there's a WB-50 weather reconnaissance aircraft flying over the northern Pacific, and it sniffs out radioactive material. And the Americans realize that the Russians have now launched a nuclear device. They now have the bomb. Two to three years ahead of when we think they were going to have a bomb. Okay? A few days later, on 1 October 1949, the People's Republic of China is established. And now the West has lost China. And so there's a concern about maybe we need to start looking at a more aggressive foreign policy with regards to the communist encroachment, as we see it. Okay? And so what happens within the State Department, we start reviewing our national policies. We had one existing called NSC 20 slash 4 that wasn't very uh, effective. We start doing something here with a new policy uh, that gets submitted in April 1950. And what it says is, we suspect that the Russians will have the ability to attack the United States with nuclear weapons as early as 1954. And it frames 1954 as the, quote, the year of maximum danger. This is when we're going to have a problem with the Soviet Union, because they can attack us with their bombers. Okay. Now, something else happens in 1950. Koreans, North Koreans, come across the border, and that war starts. So again, we're still looking at the, so the Soviet Union and the Chinese as being in cahoots. There's this monolithic communist excursion throughout the globe, and it's helped stimulate impetus for a new security policy that's framed under NSC 1968, which you can see up here is defense spending under the Truman administration before NSC 68. It's about $14 billion a year, and that's where Truman wants to keep it, because he wants to spend money on the economy, not on defense. But with what happened with the Soviet atomic bomb, the People's Republic of China, and the Korean War, guess what? We've got to spend much more money monies now on defense. And you can see the defense budget goes from a paltry $14 billion to $44 billion. Dean Acheson, who's the Secretary of State during this time, says, and I'll give you the quote, the purpose of NSC 68 was to so bludgeon the mass of the top government that not only could the president make a decision, but that it could be easily carried out. So what we're doing is we're going to start building not only more nuclear weapons, but also conventional forces. We're going to start spending more and more money on conventional buildup of our forces on top of military weapons. Also at the same time, the idea of thermonuclear weapons comes about. We can make bigger bombs, and they're more efficient. And guess what? If we make more of them, it saves a lot of money. We can destroy with one fusion weapon what would take 64 fission weapons. This is a cost savings, boss. Okay. You read some of the documents about building thermonuclear weapons, and this is really lauded as a cost savings measure. Okay. Dean Anderson also was concerned with this nuclear arms race. And what he, what he believes is that eventually the Americans and the Soviets are going to be pair, have parity with regard to nuclear applications. Our edge is going to diminish over time. So what does that leave us? Build up of conventional forces. Okay. So NSC 68 really starts spurring defense dollars. Now remember, Harry's a fiscal conservative. Okay? And by 1954 and 1955, what you're start seeing with his plan is budget deficits coming about because of our expense of funds for national defense during this time. The 1949 defense budget for the US, we spent about 6.5% of our budget on defense for the Russians spent 13.8. I know we make more stuff than the Russians, I got that part. But even with the disparities in our two economies, they are still spending much more in 1949. This also goes into the mix that we need to start spending more and more money on our defense. 
Now, enter the presidential election with President Eisenhower. He promises to wrap up Korea, bring the troops home, cut defense spending, cut taxes, stabilize the economy, and have a nice peacetime economy. Okay. He's concerned about what he refers to as the uh, democratic profligacy with regard to defense spending. He thinks we are spending way too much money on the defense. And so he, th he wants to think of better ways to spend our dollars. You can see the quote here that the Russians would like to ruin us economically as much as they would like to ruin us on the battlefield. Okay? Also at the same time, 53% of Americans believe that, yeah, maybe we should have a small military armed with nuclear weapons and we'll rely on that. So there's some buy-in but to the man and woman on the street with regard to nuclear applications. Also, Eisenhower says, you know, we got this year of maximum danger, 1954. Well, what about 1955 and 1956 and 1957? What about the years afterwards? NSC 68 is focusing on this one year. We need something that is more long-term, that is more sustainable with regard to not only the economy, but with regard to our military posture. And the quote they use is, we need something like a floating D-Day to get ready for a possible Soviet attack. So he's looking for a plan that is more long-term in this regard. So when he takes office in 1954, the first thing he does, he selects the defense budget, by like $6.5 billion. And there was all kinds of screams about, hey, what is this guy doing? He's supposed to be a, you know, a five-star general, and he's cutting the defense budget? So he takes a lot of flack for that. However, as he's coming back from Korea in 1952, after he promises to go there, he, while he's on the USS Helena, he pulls together some of his, his uh, party faithful, and he says, I want you to start reviewing national security policies. And one of the things they start doing there is they start coming up with this idea of NSC 162 and the new look. This comes about from a, a, a think tank proposition on that boat. And what happens in May of 1953, at Operation Solarium, they meet in the solarium of the White House. Okay? And they come up with a course of action to develop a new national security policy. And they divide the, this, the, uh, the operation into three sets, Task Force A, B, and C. And you can read the, the general uh, outline of what the requirements are there. But basically, the, f the first course of action is basically an extension of the containment theory that's outlined in NSC 68. We're going to keep the Russians where they're at, and that's how we're going to outlast them over the long period of time. Okay? Course of action B is going to be looking at a more vigorous containment theory, whereas we're willing to go to general war over certain battles or certain commitments that we have. We want to avoid those treasury draining commitments like Korea. Okay? But we're still willing to go to war over things. And the last one, C, is more of a rollback, if you want to use that term. We're going to throw down over this thing. And so what happens is they take these three courses of action and they go discuss and they come back and they brief them to Eisenhower. But what happens is that Eisenhower draws a little bit from each one. Okay? He believes in the course of action A that time's on our side, that Soviet Union is eventually going to fall. It's eventually going to crumble from with inside as outlined in NSC 68. He also likes B's idea of, we can buy some nukes, and they're relatively cheap, and we can do that. Okay. And the last one, he likes the rollback idea, and what he does with that is he does a lot of covert action during his tenure. A lot of offensive actions that he does covertly that are not on the, the skyline, but in order to poke the bear in that regard. So what happens that, as a result of Solarium is you come out with NSC 162, okay? <clears throat> it's approved on October uh, 30th of 1953, and it's called the New Look, okay? And the reason why it's called the New Look is because we're going to put more money now in our nuclear posture as opposed to conventional forces. Remember, those Democrats have been spending lots and lots of money on stuff well, on the military. Now we're going to spend that money on nuclear weapons. And remember, we're concerned about the economy and, by the way, not just 1954, we want this floating D-Day. We want to be concerned for the long time during this time. During this time, 40%, 47% of the budget goes to the U.S. Air Force. Now, if you're an Army or Navy officer, you've got some significant problems with this. Okay? If you started getting into roles and functions during this time. There's a two-fold purpose behind this. We want to deter the Soviets from attacking, and we want to protect Western Europe. 
That's where this fight's going to take place. And so if we have this deterrent effect with our large nuclear forces, we can keep the Russians from crossing into any new borders, and we can help protect that uh, Western Europe uh, approach. We're going to get containment on the cheap with regard to nuclear weapons, because the Russians are going to be afraid that if they do anything offensively, we're going to knock the snot out of them with our nuclear capabilities thing. The question is, the credibility of that defense posture is how the enemy sees that threat. And are you, the United States, willing to uh, trade New York City for Berlin? That's the question that needs to be asked that nobody can really answer during this time. Okay. In December 1953, they had a three-year defense program with three priorities. The offensive striking power of the Strategic Air Command as a centerpiece. Tactical nukes in 1953 are starting to come in vogue. We have now been able to take these huge weapons that we've had in stockpile for a while and get them deliverable on small single-engine or two-engine scaled airplanes that can fly these things, pickle them off, and then escape and use them in a tactical fashion. Tactical nuclear weapons are a centerpiece of this. And also we have a requirement to defend ourselves and our striking force itself through national defense and those kinds of things. Okay. So this, there's a centerpiece here. There's an offensive strategic piece. There is the tactical nuclear piece. And then there's this protection piece under NSC uh, 162. Okay. John Foster Dulles basically coins the term massive retaliation in his speech to the New York City Council on Foreign Relations in January. Okay. He later says that uh, he regrets saying the term massive retaliation, but he wanted the, uh, our potential adversaries to know that, a potential, th that they should know in advance that they can and will be made to suffer from their aggression and they cannot gain from it. A classified government document in 1955 says, there is little reason to expect the Russians to in initiate a general war that, they, that would not endanger the security of the USSR. So again, the promise here is we will retaliate to you quickly with any kind of offensive action on your part. It's the threat of it. But again, the question you have to answer yourself, how credible is that threat? Are you willing to trade New York for Berlin? Other elements of the policy also include increased reliance on uh, our allies. NATO comes about, agreements with Korea and Taiwan, the ANZUS Treaty all come about during this time. Not only are we going to rely on our nuclear capabilities, but all you other nations that are part and parcel of this, you've got to have forces as well to help support this defensive posture. Your own organic armies are part of this equation. The problem is those other nations, they're not going to they're going to rely on the U.S. to do this. They'll have some armies, but they're not going to build them up to the degree that we would like them to do. Okay. Another thing that's going to go on during this time is a lot of psychological operations. We're going to use the terms liberate. We talk about uh, our free, uh, the, our, the free world and public posturing that we are the bastions of freedom. This is a deliberate part of NSC 162. And the last one, as I intimated to you, we're going to be offensive with some of our covert actions. Uh, in, uh, Iran in 53, Guatemala in 54, Indonesia in 58, and not to mention there's a guy by the name of Gary Powers, remember that? that happens later on, but U-2 overflights, that's all part of this more offensive part of NSC-162. Okay. Tactical nukes, like I said, this is part of it. It's not just sending B-52s downrange. In a 1955 exercise called Carte Blanche, a simulated attack included 335 nuclear, nuclear bombs, 80% of them on German soil. It was estimated that in two days, 1.5 million would be killed, 3.5 million would be wounded, and there is no record of what they think the radiation deaths would be from the existing attacks. German uh, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt says, tactical nukes won't defend Europe, it will destroy Europe. Okay. But we see this as a cornerstone for containing and keeping those Russians on their side of the border. However, by 1955, what's interesting is Eisenhower increasingly sees nuclear applications in a conventional sense. 
give you a quote here from him. I see no reason why they shouldn't be used, nuclear weapons, just exactly as you would use a bullet or anything else. Quote, unquote. Now, nuclear technology is also getting better. Just after the Second World War, you basically have two or three bombs. It depends on which reference you read on how many nuclear weapons we had. We don't really tell anybody. It depends on which reference. But we're getting better technology. We can put these things on a shelf now. Because the original atomic bombs had to be assembled over a 48-hour period. It took 36 guys to do it. And they could only have a shelf life of X amount of hours. But now we can store these things because the designs are getting better. And so we're building up more and more stockpiles of these tactical nuclear weapons, not to mention the large-scale strategic ones as well. Okay. Now, you can imagine the US Air Force loves this. You got a picture here of an Army guy hugging his tank, and he's crying with the Navy hugging their ships, and they're crying. Okay. During this time, we start developing our target sets for nuclear applications. They come in three flavors, folks. Bravo, Romeo, and Delta. Bravo are blunting missions that we're going to send bombers and missiles against the Soviet atomic capabilities themselves. Those are Bravo missions. Romeo missions are retardation missions, meaning retardation of the Soviet army as they come across the border. That is those tactical nuclear applications that we were talking about. The last one are delta missions, which means we're going to disrupt Soviet industry. So that's how we start classifying whether we're going to use these things tactically or strategically. Now the question comes up about preemption. Maybe we should attack them before they attack us. And that way we can avoid having any damage to our homeland, but theirs will be completely wiped out. Eisenhower says, if I get credible uh, reports that they have launched, I will launch prior to their first strike. He is amenable to that, but he has to have credible evidence of that strike. And there's this whole question about would Curtis LeMay, who's a commander of Strategic Air Command during the first part of the 1950s, would he have launched anyway? Of course, uh, when queried about that, LeMay made the quip, well, I'll make that decision myself and I won't tell you about it. And when somebody called him on it about a first strike capability, he, the, the, the individual, the civilian says, that's not US policy. He goes, I know, it's my policy. Okay. And that's, a, that's a true story. Okay. Um, the US Air Force, after the Second World War, if you talk to an Army Air Force to become a US Air Force officer in 1945, 1946, about who won the Second World War, he did. The US Air Force won it. The Army kind of helped. So did the Navy, but strategic bombing really what is what caused the capitulation of the Germans and the Japanese. They honestly believe this. And when the bombing survey comes out in 1946, it says, eh, you were a factor in the war, not the factor in the war. There's a huge howl from the Air Force, the Army Air Force at the time, that the fact that this bombing survey is so tainted with Army and Navy flavor to it that we're not getting our full due. But the Air Force, with this new mission, they see this as a validation of strategic bombardment as they had framed the 1930s, what they executed in the 1940s, and now, see, we're the ones who are important. We're the ones who are driving the train, and nobody else is important. You Army guys, all we need you for is to defend our bases. That's all we need you for anymore. And so the Air Force gets an overwhelmingly amount um, of the, the, the budget during this time. SAC has almost total control of the target sets. LeMay is supposed to report to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs over his target sets on an annual basis. He's supposed to report to him, here's what we're going to target. You know what he tells the chairman of the Joint Chiefs? I ain't telling you, because only I need to know that. When the chief of staff of the Air Force tells LeMay, report, you will do this report, LeMay goes, I'll give you an executive summary. That's the best I'm going to do. Okay. So the Air Force is really consolidating its power during this time as a result of this new mission that it's been given. And if you look at the defense dollars between the services at this time, the first few years, that really tells the story. And the Air Force numbers will continue to grow over time. Now, when the policy is first discussed um, in 1953, 1954, they asked the Army Chief of Staff if he agrees with these numbers. 
He's a party man. He doesn't argue it. He throws out some verbiage that says he's not necessarily comfortable with it, but he says, yes, the army is amenable to these, these dollar amounts. And what happens is the army starts to become the voice of dissent over time with regard to the new look. Because they realize, you know what, you're putting all your eggs in a basket. And you're not giving yourself any wiggle room for these small brush wars that are going, as we all know, that are going to occur as a result. The army's the only ones who are really calling this stuff out. Okay. This tends to get overlooked in NSC once it's due. The defensive measures that are put in line, the dew line, which is up in Canada and, and Alaska, watching the Soviets, if they're going to launch anything coming across the, the, the polar ice caps, the polar routes become increasingly more important. That's the most direct route to get to the Soviet Union. Okay? Air defense systems, nuclear armed interceptors. Why you would put a nuclear weapon on an air-to-air -air weapon, I have no stinking idea, but we come up with this idea. Annual exercises of, executing, of uh, evacuating the federal government into their bunkers uh, happen during this time, as well as space-based defensive systems start coming about, as well as the SOSIS warning net, the sound surveillance system that's in the ocean that sniffs out Russian submarines as they're coming around during this time. So this defensive piece starts growing. However, what we start learning by 1956, 1957, is not much we can really do if they're coming. They're coming, they're coming. And so what happens, these Nike systems start going away, and these interceptor missions start going away over the course of time. Because if the Russians want to launch, there's not much you can do against them. Okay. Also during this time, we, as I mentioned when I started off in this pitch, was that thermonuclear weapons are being developed. 71% of Americans go, you bet, build them. We need them. There's no question about the morality of thermonuclear weapons in 15 megaton spectacles. The fear of fallout is less than the fear of falling behind the Russians. But there are some people who don't buy into this. Hanson Baldwin's the military correspondent for the New York Times. And this is what he has to say about this idea of <clears throat> massive retaliation in NSC 162. In February 1955, 64% of Americans thought there was going to be a war sooner or later. There was bound to be one. And we have to go ahead and build weapons and build a defensive posture to support that. Half thought that if we do have a war, it's going to be an atomic war. This is going to happen. And so it's driving this defense posture, even though Hanson Baldwin says, eh, I don't think we need to do this. And like I said, only the Army, only uh, General Ridgway, Chief of Staff of the Army, is the only one who's really pushing back, but he doesn't do it in an overt manner. He does it very subvertly. He's very guarded with what he has to say. The, the Navy, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily have a problem with it. Why? Because as tactical nuclear weapons get smaller, I can launch them off of aircraft carriers now, and that validates my carrier budget. And, oh, by the way, we have these things called ballistic missile submarines that started coming into vogue in the late 1950s. I can validate that mission as well with this nuclear piece. Now, the Air Force starts going, yeah, you're in my backyard now. I do the big nukes. But the Navy says, well, wait a minute now. We can provide you a sufficient amount of backstop if your bombers get caught on the ground. I have these things floating around the ocean now. And the Navy moves into this particular mission. And they kind of like it now because they can validate their carriers. In 1949, there's a huge stink, a huge stink between the Air Force and the Navy over the B-36 bomber and the new Air Force or the new Navy flush deck carrier. Because the Air Force is throwing up to the nuclear capability and the Navy saying, we can look carriers, that'll be better. And the Navy pushes back. And this goes all the way to the halls of Congress and the Navy loses, and they lose badly, badly. The Chief of Naval Operations is fired, and the Air Force, again, gets most of the budget during this time. So as we look back over NSC 162, we see some of the legacies that come about during this time. We start having inflexible military strategies, because we're putting everything into this Cold War basket, into this large-scale nuclear application. 
We're increasing Cold War tensions because the Russians are building their capabilities too. The Russians launched or do their first thermonuclear explosion in 1953. A little bit ahead of time than we thought. It's kind of not a thermonuclear explosion. There's some thermonuclear material, but we'll give them the credit for doing it. But we see that this is coming. And so this starts that arms race. Remember, Atchison thought that over time, our advantage with nuclear weapons was going to get increasingly smaller. And he's right because the Russians start building these things as well. You can see the stockpile grows exponentially. But 1,000 weapons in 1953, 18,000 by the 1960s when they roll around. There's political advantages uh, in this particular application, but the financial benefits were what uh, Eisenhower was really after. And know what? He doesn't really get them. He gets some, but not a lot. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> In 1952, the budget for defense is 57 billion. Okay, by 1953 it's 44 billion, and by 1954 it's 30 billion. Okay, so it's starting to come down. But then it starts going back up again. By 1955 it's 34. By 1956 it's 38 billion. By 1957 it's 45 billion. 51, 54 billion by 1959. So it goes down a little bit. But then what happens is it gets its own organizational momentum, and the costs start skyrocketing. And by the time Eisenhower leaves office in the 1960s, he kind of thinks that we have a problem here. And this is where we get that industrial military complex thing that he's so famous for coining. It's because of this. Kind of created this monster. It'll be containment on the cheap. What's happening is it's going to be more and more expensive as the defense dollars start being uh, uh, ballooned every year. What you also see is a prominence of the Air Force and the nuclear triad between our strategic nuclear bombers, the missiles, and our sub-based Polaris missiles themselves. And by the way, all of our allies, especially in NATO, guess what? You're pulled in on this. You're part of the equation. Remember we did that little uh, uh, war game in 1953 over Germany, and you lost all those people? Well, you're part of it. We're going to fight this war on your soil. So regardless, you're in on this. Whether you like it or not, Guess what? You're stepping up to the plate on this thing. And so while this thing becomes a long-term policy, it really ends up being, as most of you well know, balanced terror over the long time. This sets the stage for what we see in the 50s or in the 60s and the 70s with balances of terror and nuclear attrition and those kinds of war games that you've seen on TV. This sets the stage for that. If you're an Air Force missile air and you're sitting in a hole while the Air Force is flying around in its bombers making movies and those kinds of things, this is kind of how you see the world. And with that, I will open the floor for any questions you may have over NSC 162 or the New Look or the Cold War. Yes, sir. What residual effects do we have from the, what residual effects do we have from the uh, PSYOP policy in terms of mutually assured destruction? Uh, you mean as far as the, the legacy subsequent to 1960s? We're continuing, as, as in the military military, we continue to do these kind of PSYOP operations throughout you know, bastion of, of freedom and all these kinds of, uh, um, I'll say, propaganda during this time. Truman, or, uh, Eisenhower makes a deliberate attempt to put these messages out in the world uh, news organizations. And we, of course, we continue this same kind of operation through the 60s and 70s right up to the end of the Cold War. That becomes a cornerstone of American foreign policy during this time, sir. Does that answer your question? Uh, any plans for stand-down? Well, the Cold War is over, so I guess we... Oh, nuclear weapons you're talking about. Um, the American people certainly, as I said, they buy into this, part and parcel. They're in. They understand the requirement for this. The world environment today, I just saw an article today that my office mate sent me that the uh, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs has proposed maybe we should eradicate nuclear weapons, which is something new and unusual. He's a Marine, you know, but... But the fact of the matter is, that question just today came up in the news. That's an interesting point that you bring up. Uh, will we get rid of them? I think the door's locked, my personal opinion. 
when the Los Alamos explosion went, that door locked behind us, and I don't think we'll ever be able to unlock that door. It's my personal opinion. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, in a book I'm just now finishing up, I interviewed a Hungarian general who came up through the Cold War. And just as a side note, he said two very important things. He said, uh, number one, the world needs to know the amount of uh, uh, nuclear stop stockpiles still sitting around mm. in aban abandoned warehouses, okay. uh, not very well guarded. And the second point he made was, uh, during the Cold War, if only NATO knew what we really didn't have in mm. terms of logistical support, Port, the yeah. parts, uh, equipment needed to go to yeah. battle, he said we were far worse off. We knew we were far worse off, but NATO didn't know didn't that. Didn't know that, yeah. Well, that's, that's where the whole credible threat thing comes into play. If they were a paper tiger, that's fine, but did we know that? Probably not. And it's one thing that you see, and this goes back to the, the original comment that I had made about this idea of overkill. We only looked at, when we were going to attack, say, target A, B, and C, whatever it was, we looked at it only from a standpoint of the blast. We never looked at it from what the fire would do, or what the fallout would do, or the radiation or anything else would do to that particular target. And so as a result, we would keep targeting more and more stuff because we, would never, we wouldn't know how to determine what's the true BDA going to be for that thing. And I'm sure had we known the Russians were as hosed up as they were with regard to their capability sets, maybe that would have changed the, the posture altogether. Nobody will ever answer that question. But it's a good point. Of course, we kind of lose nukes too sometimes. Excuse me. You know, we, if anybody knows, there's a couple of thermonuclear weapons that are sitting in the U.S. that are, haven't been found. There's one off the coast of South Carolina that uh, went off into the drink and they still haven't found it to this day, still sitting in, a, uh, in the soup somewhere. Yes, sir. Uh, in view of uh, what's going on in uh, China today, Russia, do you think we could make a reasonable argument to pare down defense spending and maybe uh, transfer it to domestic spending? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I will give you my personal opinion. Okay. Um, I, I think we can pare down some of our defense spending, but I don't think we're going to eradicate war. I do think you're going to need to have you know, an army of about you know, 400,000 soldiers, a Marine Corps of about 180,000 Marines, a Navy with at least 200 ships, and an Air Force with you know, uh, about 100 wings, I think. That's, that's my opinion. Um, but there's always the wild card, and there's always Iran. And the good news about Iran is they have basically isolated themselves from the rest of the world community. Nobody likes them, you know, except themselves, of course. Um, but if they had some allies, and if they decided to go nuclear against Iran, uh, Israel, the world just changed. The world just changed. So I, that's the best answer I can give you, sir. That's my personal opinion. Yes, sir, I'm sorry, I called on you first. Uh, when did the uh, doctrine of controlled or flexible response first appear? Good question, yes. Um, when the Kennedy administration comes in the office in the 1960s and, and the McNamara Defense Department comes into play, they realize that we have put ourselves in a box or in a corner with regard to our doctrine. So we need flexible options. And from that time on, you're starting to see this focus on conventional forces. And as you all know, that's when the Green Berets come about in the early 60s. Vietnam comes about. We need to deal with these brush fire. Of course, we know Vietnam grows up with something bigger than that. But we need to deal with these brush fires. And that's when flexible response comes about, was when the Kennedy administration comes in in the 1960s, sir. So thank you for that, that question. Yes, sir. Some time ago, you and I spoke, and you mentioned that one of the first deliverable warheads yes. was probably something called a shrimp. Yes, the shrimp device. Well, first of all, was that pre or post the March 54 Castle Bravo? That is the Castle Bravo, the, the shrimp device is the Castle Be Bravo explosion. became the shrimp. I mean, yes, it is the shrimp device is the Castle Bravo device. I'm talking so about. how soon did we have that in a form it could fly from the various airports, uh, air bases? Uh, like the, 55? Yeah, but I, I, I want to say, if, I, if you pay me now, I think it's 1955 that, yeah, we figured out what we were doing wrong with our algorithms and stuff like that with regard to the shrimp device going to 15 megatons. Yeah, but 55, those things are starting to be fielded as tactical weapons or as deliverable weapons, excuse me, in our B-47s and the B-52s are coming out in 1955 as well. And then the final question was, do you know when we started doing the dispersal uh, strategy amongst the various air bases? Uh, so that they wouldn't all be taken off at one time at, off yeah. in, in Nebraska. LeMay is constantly afraid of that. Although he will say, he will say, I'm going to know, I'm going to see they're going to launch 
As soon as the other planes start spooling up, I'm going to know about it because I have a better recon apparatus out there. And we've got our RB-47s out there sniffing around, those kinds of things. He says it's going to launch. None of them are going to catch me on the ground because there are plenty of studies done by the RAND Corporation that say, your SAC bombers aren't going to get off the ground, General. They're going to be destroyed. And what LeMay's not telling him is, no, I'm launching them. And this goes back to, that's not U.S. policy. I know, but it's my policy. And LeMay's argument is, as soon as I see them spooling up, they're gone. And I'm not waiting for the president to give me a launch order. I'm doing this by myself. But they did start doing dispersal. Was that begun by 55 already? Absolutely. They're already starting to move stuff out. They're already, you have, SAT becomes a global organization. You have bases all over the globe. You start establishing fail-safe points, uh, airborne aircraft all the time. That comes about during this time, sir. If they do, well, I'm talking about during the new look application. Yes, sir, during 58. But yes, they do do a dispersal program, but LeMay will tell you, don't worry about it. I got it covered with a smile on his face. What little smiles he had, but a smile on his face. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I hope it's fair to ask this. This is kind of a question of where do we go from, from here on. Mm -hmm. And uh, first people, that, for, I mean, for everyone that, that votes, which is probably all of us, uh, you know, where, where can a person get their information? Like, I like the Strat 4. You know, the George Friedman liked to, liked to read some of his stuff. Um, and I guess, putting you on the spot, uh, are, you, are you comfortable with Strat 4? Uh, well, the world has certainly changed. And the idea of Strategic Air Command, is, as we know, I think need, need to morph into something new. Um, Strat 4 has certainly had its issues. Um, but I do think that that genie needs to be put back into a Bible to a certain degree. We can't just ignore these kinds of applications. I, I think that we have a responsibility to ourselves and to the world in general to uh, build that command to a more capable cap uh, ability set. That's my personal opinion, sir. I mean, somebody can pin me down on that one. But I think there are certainly issues with, the pro with, with that command as it currently stands. And, they think, and I think they need to, to rectify those. I'm not obviously advocating this you know, type of application anymore. But I do think we need to be a little bit more responsible with what we have. And this question has come up, too. Most of our nuclear weapons are pretty old. You need 30, 40, 50-year-old airplanes and, and missiles and stuff like that. The question is, what do you build new? Do you replace the MXs, the Minutemen? You know, what do you replace them with? Lower yields, higher yields? You know, those are some pretty tough questions to answer. And again, what's your threat? Is it Iran? Or is it these small, you know, brush fire kind of wars that we're going to be fighting, poten potentially fighting the fiction out that I would know? Okay, so therein lies, a, a, you know, the $54 million question that I really can't answer for you. People smarter than me are, are looking at that. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, Strategic Forces Command up in Omaha, uh, off at Air Force Base in Nebraska. It replaced Strategic Air Command, as you well uh, probably knew it in, you know, the, the old movies. And they have, they took not only that nuclear mission, but a number of reconnaissance missions that SAC used to have as the Cold War went away. As SAC stood down in 1992, so I'm gonna correct me if, my year is, is, if I'm off by a year or two, and Stratford took up that kind of application, not the same mission set, but those kind of long range uh, nuclear application missions, sir. Uh, in, two, in two parts, yes, sir. Uh, with SAC, as you mentioned, that they've changed over in their command. The Navy now commands it for yes. three years in a row, I believe. And, that. Mm -hmm. and a Marine at one time, too, by the Pardon? way. And a Marine officer as well, yeah. by the way. Yeah. But one of the things that I, you mentioned that the SAC was worried about their taking off at one time, it used to be depending on what the political situation was, that it would be anything from 20 to 50 percent of the flights were already on the, in the air. Mm -hmm. And that the you know, and SAC used to be really aggressive. He used Absolutely. to make penetration flights. Absolutely. Whole squadrons would uh -huh. head for Russia. And yeah, that stuff's called act of war, but anyway, go ahead. And at the yeah. last minute would pull away. Yeah. He used to drive the Russians nuts. Yeah. And they said, by the way, they had a uh, United States Navy ran across a uh, cable that the, United, that the Russians had in a harbor, and they tapped it, and after about two years of reading everything that the United or the Russian military had, they found that the Russians were paranoid about being attacked rather than their idea of being offensive. Mm. Well, there, uh, John Lewis Gaddis, uh, one of the you know, premier Cold War historians, 
when he talks about the 1950s, he said, and he talks about you know, Stalin before he you know, dies in the early part of the 50s, he says what the Russians are really more worried about is their own national survival, survival of the regime itself, and then they're worried about expansion. This is what Gaddis' argument is, is that, yeah, they're more concerned about being attacked than they are about being expansionist. And of course, what are our concerns? We're more concerned about being attacked than we are being expansionist. It's interesting how both sides are fearful of the same things. Now, not that I'm supporting the Russians, but think about this. They've been invaded twice you know, in the past 50 years, in the First World War and the Second World War. The Second World War, the US and our British allies, we lose about 300,000, half a million people total, and the Russians, 30 million. And that's one estimate, as high as 50, as low as 20. You know, as you can kind of see why they are the way they are. I'm not defending their actions, but you can certainly see the paranoia that they would have. We just got slapped twice in a 30-year time span. You know, it certainly feeds into you know, some of their paranoia with regard to that. Even until the late 1980s, 1990s, since you mentioned it, we're sending flights over the polar ice cap, um, probing their defensive postures, sending aircraft in to, to check their response times. How fast are they launching their alert aircraft to intercept our aircraft? We're doing this stuff right up until the end of the Cold War. You know, and so the Russians are definitely paranoid about their defensive postures on that one. Yes, sir. What were some of the uh, factors behind Eisenhower's uh, message in departing of beware of the military industrial yeah. complex? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'll give you my interpretation of Eisenhower. Because, as I mentioned, this starts taking a life of its own in terms of the budget. Remember, we do this for fiscal reasons. Because the Democrats are spending too much money on defense with these conventional forces, I'll buy nukes. Nukes are cheaper. In that way, we'll have better prosperity. That's what we want anyway. And what happens is that these ideas of nuclear deterrence take on a life of their own and they become more and more expensive and they become more and more complex with ballistics missile submarines, bal uh, uh, ballistic missiles, the submarines themselves, these high-speed bombers like XB-70s and stuff like that, these things start getting expensive and more complex and drawing more and more from the U.S. economy. And I think that by the time he leaves office in 1960, he realizes there's a problem here. We started this thing to have defense on the cheap, and it has taken a life of its own. And I, I'm convinced that that's why he says what he does. I think there's a little bit of regret in Eisenhower's mind uh, about this particular issue. So I think that's why he says that. Yes, sir. Uh, this is kind of a, a two-part question. First of all, you, you mentioned the over, over flights that we had. Yes, sir. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you, you couple that with the paranoia of the Soviets. Uh, did we risk uh, by these overflights them making a mistake in attacking us? And on the other hand, what if they did the same thing to us? Absolutely. You know, so it's, but it sounds awfully risky. It does. Well, go back to when I had the, the three courses of action for NSC 162, and the last course of action was a rather aggressive one. And remember, I takes a little bit from that. I may not launch an all-out strike, but I'm going to poke you a little bit. I'm going to send U-2s and, and those kinds of things over there to kind of check you out. There's a little bit of that, not to mention the covert action that we're, going, that we're doing during this time. So that's all part and partial of this policy that they framed uh, in 1953 and sign off to 1954. That, that, that's part of it. Now, the one thing we do without doing overflight, we'll fly right next to the border and we have these side-looking cameras and radars and we'll just fly along your, your coastline there and look in as far as we can. We also have some goofy ones where we launch balloons in Europe and we let the jet stream take them across the Soviet Union, and the balloons will theoretically end up in the Pacific Ocean, and then we'll collect all the film. Well, where do you know where the balloon went? And when it lands in the, in the Pacific Ocean, where is, you know, it's kind of a goofy idea, but it gets around some of these overflight problems that we have uh, as a result of the Cold War. Yes, sir. Was General LeMay uh, was General LeMay ever in danger of getting himself court-martialed? Was he? Yeah. It seems to me MacArthur did about the same thing, yeah. and look what happened to him. Um, to answer your question, no. The only time LeMay is ever concerned about being court-martialed, I'll be honest with you, is in 1945. Uh, he, when we firebombed Japan, starting the first raid on March 9 and 10, 1945, he does it all by himself. 
He doesn't tell Half Arnold he's going to drop the bombers down to 10,000 feet. We're going to do incendiary area bombardment. He doesn't tell them. He tells them after the fact. And even LeMay will say, quote, if we lose this war, I'm going to be tried as a war criminal. He says that. Now, when Half Arnold finds out about it, you know what he tells him? Keep up the good work. <laughs> the quote, this proves you have the guts for anything. That's what he tells LeMay. But when LeMay is commander in chief of SAC, uh-uh. Now, where does LeMay go after SAC, do you know? He's the uh, 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 vice chief of staff of the Air Force. And then in 1960, he becomes chief of staff of the Air Force in the uh, Johnson administration and in the Kennedy administration. Interestingly enough, his boss is a guy by the name of Robert McNamara. Anybody know what Mac McNamara did in the Second World War? He ran numbers for Curtis LeMay in the 20th Air Force as a lieutenant colonel. Now, when LeMay takes over as chief of staff of the Air Force, those two guys don't get along at all. And LeMay loses about every fight with McNamara on this piece. But as far as being court-martialed, no. Uh, LeMay sees himself uh, as doing what would be required to defend his nation. And I don't think he has any pangs of guilt over the decisions that he would make had the attack come. I don't think he would feel any pang of guilt over it. Do you have an explanation for how it is that LeMay got away with that? Le, yeah, good question. Um, when LeMay gets picked to be the chief of staff of the Air Force, there's a lot of people that are going, what? Him? Why him? Keep in mind that President, that President elect Kennedy doesn't have a lot of credentials on the foreign policy or on the military side of the House. And by picking LeMay, a proven cold warrior, and he's also a darling of Congress, these guys like LeMay, cigar chomping, lots of ribbons, you know, World War II air hero. He's got the credentials for that job politically. And he's got a lot of congressional backing on this. A lot of people who don't like him, don't get me wrong, but he's got the credentials for that job, which is one of the reasons, not only is he picked to be the chief of staff of the Air Force for one term, but two terms two-term chief of staff of the Air Force. So his professional reputation is pretty solid within the Congress itself. No, there's a lot of people like that who hate him, who don't like him. And if you're me, I think he's a failure as a chief of staff of the Air Force, quite frankly. I think he's wrong in many of his visions about where the Air Force needed to go. And he's the one who wants to send nukes into Cuba. He's the one who wants to bomb the North Vietnamese on the front end of this thing and about bombing them back at the Stone Age. You can disagree with me if you want, that's fine. I'm just giving you my two cents worth on this. But he has the Cold War credentials for the Kennedy administration. Yes, sir. Uh, what was Eisenhower's opinion of the writings of uh, George Kennan? Yeah, yeah. Well, Kennan, after he gets shuffled off and gets replaced by Nietzsche in uh, NSC 68, um, Remember, he draws in those three courses of action. Course of action A is containment as outlined in NSC 68 or, or, or out, excuse me, outlined in the, the Mr. X article. Okay? He draws from that and he says, yeah, that, that's a valid assumption that we should establish as one of our elements of NSC 162. So he agrees with that. But now, Kennan would argue, you know, just before he dies, he says, we took that too literally in regard to the military application. I meant more economically containment and social containment of the Soviet Union. But I would think Eisenhower, and I'll speak for him, I think he buys into at least the idea, the foundations of what Kennan is framing in his Mr. X article uh, in Foreign Affairs in 1947. Yes, sir. I was just looking back at my notes and I noticed that you mentioned that in 1953 we had a thousand uh, nuclear Your devices. Weapon. Yes, sir. 54, we, we've tried our first deliverable weapon. Yes, sir. So what were these 1,000? I mean, what kind of, uh, what caused us to build 1,000 devices that we didn't know if we could deliver? Yeah, good question. Uh, what happens is that the weapons that we have, those are regular uh, fission weapons, fat man, little boy type fission weapons, as opposed to fusion, which is thermonuclear weapons. And a, f a, a fission weapon, I'm not a, uh, a, a physicist, I'm a history professor, so don't ask me about how the molecules all move around, I can't tell you, okay? 
a fission weapon is theoretically limited to, to one megaton. Don't ask me why they picked the number, that's what they picked. But a fusion weapon, a thermonuclear weapon can go as big as you want, theoretically. Matter of fact, the Russians years later explode a 50 megaton device. It's not a deliverable weapon, but Russians being Russians, we got the biggest 50 megatons. And of course, ours was a 15 megaton Castle Bravo. But what you're having in, during that time, sir, is fission weapons with you know, uranium-235 and those kinds of things, not fusion weapons. Can I rephrase my question? Yes, sir. Were we flying missions in 51, 52, 53 carrying fission weapons? We're certainly training with them. But we didn't carry them. We weren't flying uh, wep missions that could have then gone on to Russia at that point. No, 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 no. Matter of fact, it isn't until uh, late, um, get my year right, I want to say 1954, my ear may be wrong, where they finally allow the U.S. military access to the nuclear weapons themselves. During the first parts of the Truman administration, the military can't put their hands on a bomb. They got to go through the Atomic Energy Commission. The Atomic Energy Commission's got to say, yes, you can have it. Oh, and then they got to build the bomb, because remember, we can't put these things in a stockpile because of the way they're configured. It isn't until, I want to say 53, my ear may be wrong, that the military has direct access to the nuclear weapons themselves. And this is one thing LeMay asked for. When he takes over SAC in 1947, that's one of the first things he asked for. I want access to those weapons. And Truman says, no. But later on, he goes, yes, you can. Any other questions? I bored you enough with nuclear nightmare? Yes, sir. What kind of overhead was incurred for the uh, people that were PSYOP custodians of the various targeting lists? Overhead, what are you, what are you referring to? Like the security clearances or uh, protection measures? You got me, I don't know. It wasn't there and <laughs> I haven't seen any documentation towards that and I, I really couldn't tell you. Uh, I, I do know in my dissertation research, I will tell you this, um, I came across many documents of this period that were redacted, meaning they were black paragraphs were blacked out. I asked for uh, release of that information and was told repeatedly no. Even though this stuff is 50 years old, it's still, a lot of it is still classified. So I think there's a lot more histories to be known about the, the, this particular period of time, but the stuff is still classified to this day. It's still classified. Okay. I'm getting the hook, so I appreciate your time and letting me expose on a topic I find fascinating. So thank you very much.